Welcome to the New York Times Book Review Podcast. I'm Gilbert Cruz, the new editor of the Books Desk, and for the next many months, we'll be highlighting great author interviews from our Decade Plus archive. This week, we're featuring a pair of conversations. The first is from 2011. Sam Tannenhaus, who was then the editor of the Book Review and host of this podcast, spoke with the actor John Lithgow about his memoir, Drama and Actor's Education. Okay, so you say acting is storytelling. What do you mean? I, I guess an actor is a part of a, a large machine of storytelling. that You play characters, but basically you're unfolding a story for an audience. Uh, an actor is sort of on the inside of that story and helping bring it, bring it to life. And sort of late in my life, I've made storytelling into a, a sort of adjunct of acting in plays. And for you, it began at an extremely early age. You're from Yellow Springs, Ohio, yeah, that's right? That's right. Antioch College. And... That's right. My dad was on the faculty there. And you started acting very young. And he was very serious. Shakespeare, yeah. you learned early. He, he created Shakespeare festivals in Ohio all through my young years, four of them in all. Uh, one of them, the Great Lakes Theater Festival in Cleveland, is still going on. Mm -hmm. And it was just part of our lives. Uh, we... Antioch was the first of them in the, and, and a long, sustained one in which he produced every single one of Shakespeare's plays. The first line of the book proper is, I started acting before I even remember. Then you went to Harvard, mm -hmm. and you say in the book, this was actually the most creative time in your life. Mm -hmm. Why? When were you there, in the 60s? I was there between 63 and 67. Interestingly, when I went to Harvard, I wasn't interested in being an actor. You wanted to be an artist. My creative ambition was to be an artist, to be a painter and a printmaker. Uh, and that fell by the wayside almost immediately because I, I sort of fell in with the theater gang at Harvard, which is a, always has been, by tradition, tremendously active, uh, engaged, and very talented, even though nobody goes there to study acting. Because I, by osmosis, I was already a very experienced actor. I just became the campus star almost immediately. Literally within a week of arriving at Harvard, I was cast in a major role on the main stage of the Low Drama Center. So that was the point when you realized this is what you were going to do. Yeah. By this, my second year at Harvard, I was spending more time doing plays, directing operas, designing sets for ballets, just working in every, like everything that came along, I would try it. Then you went off to London in an equally exciting time. Mm -hmm. It was London in the 60s. Yeah. But it was just the opposite. London was tremendously rigorous academic training. They sort of thrashed us, uh, but in a very good way. I mean, it was terrific training. John, you grew up in a theater family. Your father encouraged you. Yet when you told him you'd be going to London to study acting, he was flabbergasted. Yeah, well, he didn't encourage me, but he didn't discourage me either. We, we never even addressed the subject. He never figured, nor I never figured, that, we, that I would actually become an actor. And when I decided to audition and apply for a Fulbright to go to England, it took him completely by surprise. It was a measure of how oblivious he was <laughs> about what was really going on with me. But you also say how innocent, naive you were. Exactly. It was, it, it was a sort of dual misperception of each other. So I told him, good news, Dad, I'm going <laughs> to audition for a Fulbright to study acting. And his face fell as if I had told him I had a terminal disease. And at that moment, I realized how difficult the business had been for him. I think until then, I had sort of seen him as this kind of, uh, I think I describe it in the book as an insouciant ringmaster. You know, he was a theater director who seemed to so completely enjoy what he was doing. It's an incredibly difficult profession. And on that occasion, he sort of told me just exactly what I was signing on for if I did this, how, how hard it is to sustain a family to make money and sort of thrive and prosper, how unpredictable, how you have to make very good friends with rejection and failure and disappointment. And he made this 
this astonishing suggestion. He said, why not business school? <laughs> and I, I, it was like a suggestion from Mars. And did he even really mean that? He did. He said on that occasion, he admitted to feeling very inept as a manager and uh, making budgets, per personnel issues. He said, you could learn this. You could acquire this. He always regretted that he hadn't learned administrative skills. Mm -hmm. And I just thought this was the craziest suggestion I'd ever heard. I wanted to be an artiste. And in some way, did that steal you and your resolve? I mean, it's kind of the classic thing. Dad says no. and I don't think I was defiant. I just mm. ignored the advice. I just went ahead and did what I was planning to do. Yeah. P.S., within a year, he was hiring me, you know, not only to act, but to direct and design for him. Okay, now I'm going to ask you something very different mm -hmm. that uh, – made you the envy of me and all my male colleagues at the book review. You had an involvement with the singular Liv Ullman. Mm -hmm. How did that happen? Uh, well, why you? Uh, why me? Well, I was cast opposite her in a very passionate play, Anna Christie, uh, a play that has begat, for example, the marriage of Liam Neeson and Natasha Richardson, you know. Great O'Neill play uh, about Anna Christie, the prostitute, and Matt Burke, the, coal sto the Irish coal stoker, who meet in a shipwreck. She saves him. He falls madly in love with her. Uh, I fell madly in love with Leave. Of course, I was already in love with Leave, as obviously you were too back in those days. My entire long chapter on that chapter of my life is a chapter about the volatile chemicals of acting. I mean, the fact that you put your emotions to work. That can lead to very intense emotional involvements almost in spite of yourself. And just so our listeners are reassured, you're also the author of but seven or eight children's mm -hmm. books. Yes. And when did that begin? And why? Well, there's, there's a chapter in the book about that. And it's a chapter about my baby sister, Sarah Jane, who is 10 years younger than I. Uh, there are three of us siblings older than Sarah Jane. So she sort of grew up with two real parents and three sibling parents. And I was the closest to her in age. So when my older siblings took off for school, uh, it was Sarah Jane and me in the household. And I was her constant babysitter kind of best pal when I was 15 or so when she was five or I was 16 and she was six I entertained her mm. I adored her I still adore her that was the beginnings of entertaining children when my own children came along I was already writing songs and playing the guitar for kids I started performing concerts for school benefits and in their classrooms before you knew it, I was a kid's entertainer and really loved doing it. This was concurrently with my grown beginning career, the beginnings of my career as an actor. And it's just, it's such an incredibly fun thing to do. Kids' audiences are so astonishingly responsive. They're difficult audiences, but they're very, very exciting. As much today as they were generally. Oh, yeah. Well, kids don't change. Mm -hmm. uh, and I write about that in great detail in the book, the, the whole phenomenon of suspension of disbelief. That's what you that's what you seek as an actor in front of an adult audience, but you never attain it. An adult audience always knows you're pretending. Kids lose all track of that. They barely even remember they're in a theater. They are so engaged. Uh, and I just love that. John, at one point in the book, you mentioned some of the really gifted actors you work with and do so with the understanding that readers may not recognize some mm -hmm. of these names now. How mm -hmm. much luck is involved in having a long, sustained career like yours? Well, there's a lot of luck involved uh, you know, the acting profession is so much of the moment as the as the sort of act of entertaining is. It really only exists while it's happening. And then poof, it's gone like a will of the wisp. The more an actor can sort of accommodate himself to the truth that he will eventually be forgotten, the better off he is. Because you can't live everything I do. You have to savor the fact that what we do is like electricity. It just 
It crackles and then it's gone. It lives on in memory for a while, but not long. Even film performances? Yeah. Films are not the same. Yeah, You feel, oh, good, film is immortal. It goes on forever. But how many people really sit and watch TCM to see the great performances from 1935? I remember an appalling moment working with my dear young protege, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, when we were both on Third Rock from the Sun. He's now a major movie star. God bless him. Deserves everything that comes his way. Us older actors were chatting and mentioned Cary Grant. And he said, who's Cary Grant? No. And my heart just He really didn't know? And this was a very sophisticated 15-year-old kid who knew, who, who as far as I was concerned, knew everything. And he was asking me, who is Cary Grant? Well, we know who you are. Yeah, for know. the moment. <laughs> Thanks so much. Our second conversation from last year is with the author Maggie O'Farrell, who spoke on the podcast about her acclaimed novel Hamnet, which imagines the home life of William Shakespeare and his family. O'Farrell's new novel, The Marriage Portrait, is set in Renaissance Italy, and it's out on Tuesday. This is John Williams. In Hamnet, her eighth novel, Maggie O'Farrell imagines the life of William Shakespeare, his wife Anne Hathaway, or Agnes, and the life and death of one of the couple's children, Hamnet, who died at 11 in 1596. In O'Farrell's novel, he dies of the plague, and the book imagines the impact that this event might have had on arguably Shakespeare's greatest play, Hamlet. Hamnet won the National Book Critics Circle Award for Fiction, and it was named by the New York Times Book Review as one of its 10 best books of 2020, with the editors calling it a bold feat of imagination and empathy. And Maggie O'Farrell is here to talk about it from Edinburgh. Hi, Maggie. Hi, how are you doing? I'm good. What do we know historically that's in this novel? Just how bare are the bones that you were working with when you sat down? Well, I mean, they are. Shakespeare himself is quite a shadowy figure. There's an awful lot about him we don't know, despite the very best efforts of the world's most brilliant scholars and Shakespearean academics. So it is mysterious. You know, we only have, say, six examples of his signature, all of which are spelt differently. <laughs> so there are lots of longers and gaps in his story. You know, if we think we know very little about him, we know even less about his wife, the woman we've been told to call Anne Hathaway and his children. You know, we only, Hamnet himself, the boy, is lucky if he gets possibly two mentions in these big biographies of Shakespeare and the merchant that he was born and they mention that he died, like you say, in 1596. But actually, I mean, to be honest, that that is all we do know about little Hamnet, unfortunately. We have the record of his birth in the parish records and then we see the record of his burial. But then we have this extraordinary towering echo of his name in Shakespeare's play, which he went on four or five years after Hamlet died to write. And what do we know about, well, first of all, tell the story about how you found out to call her Agnes, which I think is a great detail. (laughs) Well, you know, as I was saying, I mean, what we know about the woman that Shakespeare married is very, very little indeed. She was actually born before parish records commenced, so we don't actually know the date of her birth. We know that they got married. We know that she was six months pregnant when they got married, or thereabouts, because they had a daughter, Susanna, six months after they they were married. But it wasn't it wasn't unusual for brides to be pregnant in those days because they had this ritual called hand fasting, which is a bit like an engagement. And it, it seems to be, if you look at the parish records and then check them against the birth records, it seems to be that about a third or a quarter of brides were pregnant when they went to the altar. So hand fasting was obviously a different kind of fasting as well. <laughs> <laughs> and we know that she lived to, for a pretty great age. She lived until well into her 60s, which in those days was extraordinary when the you know average life expectancy was 47. I think what intrigued me most about her, or what shocked me, I should probably say, when I was researching the book, is that given how little we know about her, this hasn't stopped so many people from piling in to criticise her and vilify her and treat her with such terrible opprobrium and hostility. You know, we've always been taught this one single narrative about Anne Hathaway, and that's from historians and scholars, other novelists, writers of Oscar-winning screenplays. They've all told us that she was an older, strumpet peasant woman who lured this boy genius into marriage and that he hated her, that he had to run away to London to get away from her. He sorely regretted his ever marrying her. And, you know, I have never, ever, despite trawling through as many books as I possibly can on the subject, found a single shred of evidence for this. In one of the other interviews you've done, you said there's such a myth surrounding her and it's all filled with hate. It made me wonder if one of the things you had in mind while you were writing this is the question of why we don't conjecture more generously. 
about people? I don't know whether it is some strange desire for our male artists to be footloose and fancy free. I don't know why we there is this overwhelming urge to give Shakespeare a retrospective divorce. You know, what is that about? <laughs> you know, I, I I I think he did love her. I think they loved each other. I think there was a partnership. And and the most significant detail for me was not the one that everybody will bring up to criticize her, which is of course the famous second best bed behest in Shakespeare's will which is an interlineation. It's squeezed in between two lines. And his will is a very dry document. He doesn't show any affection for anybody at all at any of his behests. I mean, he was dying. <laughs> Let's not forget. But you wouldn't think the will was written by the same person that came from the same mind as the person who wrote probably the greatest lines of love poetry. But what's more significant to me is that at the end of his career in London, he was the equivalent of a multimillionaire. He was a very, very good businessman. But he could have set up household anywhere he wanted to in the world. But when he retired, he came back to Stratford to live with his wife, which to me is much more telling. And I think what really struck me when I was researching the character of Anne Hathaway is that I read her father's will. So her father, Richard Hathaway, died a year before she married William. And in his will, he leaves her a very generous dowry. And he refers to her as my daughter, Agnes, or it would have been pronounced close to the French, Agnes or Annis. And that felt like a kind of lightning bolt moment because I thought, you know, it just seemed emblematic of how she has been treated that we've looks as though we've been calling her by the wrong name for almost half a millennium. So I decided to give this name back to her because I want readers to forget everything they think they know about Mrs. Shakespeare and open themselves up to a new interpretation of a different woman they haven't yet met. She strikes such a figure in your introduction of her in the book, which is when William, who is tutoring a family of kids in Latin, looks out the window and sees her, doesn't know who she is yet, and sees her walking with this kestrel on her I guess on her wrist or her shoulder or... <laughs> on her, yeah, on her glove. You have on to her have glove. a glove for a castle. They got very sharp, very sharp claws. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I wonder how you initially saw her in your mind. Was she that striking? I mean, she kind of enters in this very intriguing way in the novel. You, you can't wait to get to know who this person is. I mean, I think their marriage was unusual for the time, partly because she, I mean, I think she, she was about the average age of a bride. She was 26. And like I said, she came from a quite respectable family and she had this pretty sizable dowry. But he was, by contrast, was 18. He was underage. So in order to get married, they had to have a special license. And his family, by contrast, had been of quite high social standing in Stratford. His father had been a very successful glover. But in more recent years, the family's finances had taken a huge hit and their social standing had taken a huge hit because his father, John Shakespeare, had started illegally trading in wool and he'd got himself into all kinds of debt and trouble. He'd been held up in court for not attending church. He had a summons and had to pay a fine because he dumped what's described as Audier on the street outside the house on Henley Street. And so <laughs> I, mean, I don't I think we can go, fill in those I blanks. Think we, don't even know, we, we don't want to go into what that was. <laughs> so, you know, it, by contrast, his family had sort of taken this big downturn. And I think their marriage is intriguing to me because, you know, I think everybody has always throughout history has said, why did he marry her? Why did this boy genius marry this probably illiterate woman? In her book, Shakespeare's Wife, Jermaine Greer says that we've been asking the wrong question all along, that we should have been asking, why did she marry him? You know, why did this girl with a good dowry and from a you know, respectable family marry this penniless, tradeless boy of 18? <laughs> right. He's not, he's not the author of Hamlet at this point, he's, uh, to say the not least. The of <laughs> I mean, I think he was probably a bit of an oddball. You know, I think how, how much he must have stuck out in a small rural market town in the English countryside. I mean, we know now, of course, what was inside his mind, what he was capable of. But then, I mean, I think probably people thought him just a bit of a bit of a strange one, I imagine. So I think I was I was trying to envisage him at the time through her eyes and thinking, you know, why would she have married him? Why would she have chosen him when she could have married, you know, a, probably quite a respectable, wealthy farmer? And I thought, well, maybe she saw something in him that others didn't. Maybe she saw what he was. Maybe she had a glimpse of, of what he would be in future be capable of. So I suppose it was that that kind of idea of slight sort of second sights like prophecy, which of course is something that runs throughout the plays. You know, you, you'd you be hard pressed to find a play where there's not some sense of prophecy, future destiny involved in it. So I, I was just intrigued by that idea. So, that, that, so that's why she is the person she is in my book. Well, thanks for that segue, because I was about to ask about the prophecy angle of things. Our reviewer, Geraldine Brooks, described Agnes as close to the natural world and uncannily intuitive. I would say that it's fair to say that she's more like clairvoyant 
that she senses things in a kind of supernaturalish way. She sees the future and she she knows details about people's lives before they tell her. How was it to get inside that mindset? And I wonder, having read your your memoir, I Am, I Am, I Am, which is about 17 near-death experiences you've had and, and has a very, if not supernatural, uh, an eerie quality for sure. I wondered whether you felt any kinship with that sense of feeling the, the sort of tides of fate moving around more more clearly. God, I wish I did have second sight. It would be something that would be very <laughs> useful for me in life and in work. Unfortunately, I don't. <laughs> so maybe Agnes was a kind of wish fulfillment character for me. I mean, I think I was looking back mostly at the plays, at Shakespeare's writing and the themes that he grappled with, and also particularly his female characters. I wanted to be quite circumspect and careful not to read too much biography into his plays, because I think that I think that's a slippery slope. And I think his plays are filled with they are filled with very mysterious female characters who are prophets. You know, I'm thinking of the witches and Macbeth who can tell things and have, you know, and also a tiny bit of Ophelia as well. I feel that Ophelia is this very marginalised figure in Hamlet. I mean, deliberately so, you know, she's made marginal, but also she has this incredible insight, which is revealed in the scene where she's mad and she hands people cures, she hands people plants, which are, every single one is a cure for a flaw that she perceives in their character. So I was just thinking about that. And I, I think that's where Agnes came from. But also, I think it's important to remember that as a society, people in the 16th century were much more closely tied to the natural world than we are, much more tied to the you know cycle of the seasons and the sort of circadian rhythms, the diurnal cycle, and also to superstition. In one strange way, you know, you, you had to go to church. It was against the law not to attend church once a week. And you would be fined and held up in court if you didn't attend but conversely, I think also people, there was this great belief in superstition and prophecy and the supernatural and witchcraft, you know, I mean, I, I, and I think we have to remember that, you know, that there is a huge discrepancy between the society and our lives today and then there were from the people in the 16th century. So I suppose I was, I was tapping into that as well. It is interesting because in the book, she has such a, it's such a combination of those things that feel a little unworldly, but then she's so incredibly tied to the earth and the plants and the the bees and all of these other things. I know that you've been working on this, or not working on this book, but you've been thinking about working on this book for a very long time, and that you are the author of many novels, and that over the years you've gone back to this a bit and tried your hand at it, and then for one reason or another put it aside. And I'm wondering if there are any big ways that well, first of all, just whether you ever got far enough into it for much to change or whether there was ever any kind of different grand design for it than the final product. It is a book that I wanted to write for, for a long time, but I did have, and in fact, I had my own brand of superstition about it. Not that I'm a very superstitious person, but I I knew that in order to write the book, I was going to have to put myself inside the mind of a woman who is forced to sit at her son's bedside and, and have to watch him die and then lay him out for burial. And I, you know, I, I have a son and two daughters myself, uh, just like the Shakespeare did, but actually they're in a slightly different birth order. My son's the eldest. And I, I realised that I was <laughs> going to be unable to write this book until my own son was past the age of 11, which, of course, is the age that Hamlet died. Not that there was a big risk of him contracting the Black Death, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but you never know. And I just I just couldn't do it. Every now and again, I would make a sort of, I would start researching it and I would make a kind of foray and I'd, I'd start typing a little bit of the, uh, writing a bit of the story and, and I just found myself veering away from it. I thought, I, I, I don't want to go to that place. I don't want to imagine that this event happening. Because I knew that inevitably I would be thinking about my son when I was creating the character of Hamnet. You know, and and I'm, I do remember watching my son at the age of 11, watching him and his friends, because it is a very interesting developmental age, 11. It is a sort of high watermark of childhood. It's childhood's final months, you know, before you start the sort of tip into adolescence and it is, there's something particularly poignant about 11-year-olds, I find, not just because I obviously was thinking about Hamlet. So anyway, so, so that was that was the major reason why. And I've actually written three books instead of writing <laughs> <laughs> as a kind of distraction. <laughs> but then when I finished writing my memoir, I sort of gave myself a talking to. I sort of looked myself in the eye and said, you know, you either have to do this book or you've got to forget about it. You know, you've just got to write it or move on to something else. You can't keep circling around it. So I don't know why, but for some reason, it just seemed like the right point in my life and the planet seemed aligned and it was just the right time to write it. Reading about this book before I read it, it was hard for me to tell just how much the balance was between Agnes Hamnet and Shakespeare himself. And then when I read it, I realized they are all three major characters in the book, although William, as has been pointed out many times, is not is never named in the book. You never call him William or Shakespeare. And so was he ever a more central character? Or was this always going to be her story and and the story of the grief? of the, the son and, and his life? 
I always knew it was going to be a kind of ensemble novel. I knew that I wanted at least the first half to mostly focus on Hamlet because the engine behind the book for me was always the fact that I think Hamlet has been overlooked and underwritten by history. You know, I think he's been consigned to a literary footnote. And I mean, I believe quite strongly that without him, without his very short and tragically short life, we, we wouldn't have the play Hamlet. You know, we probably wouldn't have Twelfth Night. And I think as a as as an audience, we are enormously in debt to him. And I think, you know, I, I find it strange always that when I read books about Shakespeare, that Hamlet's life was very downplayed and uh, that people would wrap up his death in statistics about child mortality. And almost as if the implication was that the that he wasn't grieved because, you know, so many children died. And also, you know, I find it astonishing that nobody has ever really made much of the fact that it's the same name. You know, in in Elizabethan times, spelling was a lot less stable. Hamlet and Hamlet are interchangeable in parish records. It's the same name. And I've read biographers saying, you know, we, we've no idea what the significance is. And I want to kind of shake these people and say, are you, are you serious? <laughs> Come on. Nobody, nobody would take their dead child's name lightly. That is not an act that you'd undertake lightly and give it to the title of your of, of this tragedy, to give it to the, the protagonist of the tragedy and also the ghost. You know, the idea that he would have had to write that name over and over again in the manuscript, he would have had to hear it over and over again during the rehearsals and also speak it himself because it is there is a, a written evidence that Shakespeare himself took the role of the ghost in the first production of Hamlet. And I don't think any parent would do that lightly. It's an act of enormous significance. And, you know, Shakespeare, for all his mystery, the fact that he is this very shadowy figure, it's always seemed to me that in that act of calling this play and the protagonist and the ghost after his dead son, he becomes briefly visible to us as a human being, as a person, as a heartbroken father. You're very convincing when you talk about it and in the book about the connections that you're making and the way that you say that uh, you feel very strongly that we wouldn't have the play without... Hamnet, and we might not have Twelfth Night. And Shakespeare is, as you know better than anyone, probably not the most placid subject. There are what are called the Shakespeare Wars. And because there are so many gaps in our knowledge about him, I think those are filled in by very passionately contested imaginings of what he might have been like. So even though clearly you're writing fiction and have a lot of license to do so, I wonder if there's been any strange reaction to the book or any fevered feelings from people who think that your your hypotheses go against their life's work. <laughs> <laughs> not that I'm aware of. I mean, actually, to be very honest, I tend not to read my reviews, so I wouldn't know, actually. But as far as I know, nobody has come out and said, how dare you, or <laughs> 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 who knows? Maybe there are, though. You know, you've got to give a sort of allowance for people that are going to have ideas that diverge from yours. And I think people, especially people who are involved in, you know, the very long interpretations of Shakespeare. People are going to have their own ideas and interpretations. Everybody has their own version of Shakespeare inside their head, you know, and that's and that's fine. You know, I think everybody's allowed a different interpretation, aren't they? It, it's not that I would watch somebody else's or read somebody else's and feel enraged. I would just think, well, <laughs> their, their vision of it differs from mine. I avoided watching any screen versions of him while I was writing the book, just because I didn't, I didn't want that in my head. But, you know, I know for a fact that Ben Elton has a, has a comedy series about my, my son is a, is a fan of a comedy series, actually. but I, I haven't watched it myself just because, not because I think it would upset me, just because I know that it would be different from mine. And that's, that's fine. <laughs> I guess I just, I have a twisted sense of humor. I guess I just find it comical that people probably working in more historical veins, trying to find the capital T truth are, are probably wedded to these things that are somewhat fictional themselves. But he, he certainly comes alive in the book and not really as the playwright. I mean, like you're saying, for most of the book, there's just a sense of him as this very young and he might have potential, but he doesn't feel like an important historical figure. He just feels like this person who's living his life. And I guess I'll finish by asking you, you know, you said early on that you believe they were in love and there's a lot of less charitable conjecture out there. And so I guess I'll ask with sort of a romantic question, which is what does your will see in your Agnes and what does she see in him? And why are they together in, in your mind? Well, I think there's, in my novel anyway, and the way I see them, I think it's a kind of exchange of different types of artistry. So much has been made of the fact that the wife of Shakespeare was possibly illiterate. And to be honest, she probably was, because what daughter of a sheep farmer in 16th century would have been taught to read. I mean, it's possible he taught her later on, but I mean, I think mostly she probably was illiterate. But you know, it, it it's not it's not a huge stretch to say 
illiteracy doesn't necessarily mean stupidity. There are other types of intelligence. And I've always been fascinated by the, I mean, I'm, I'm sure I'm not alone in this, the reach of Shakespeare's metaphors. You know, he, in, in throughout his plays and poetry, he displays an extraordinary breadth of knowledge across an astonishing number of subjects. And I think I just like the idea that some of these he might have got from her. So obviously we were talking about the the herbology in, in Hamlet. So he's obviously writing about that from a very informed perspective. And it, it is well known that it was the woman of the household who had to have that kind of knowledge that every household would have had their own little physic garden. And the woman of the house would have been able to make potions and cures for minor ailments within her household. So I just imagine the idea that he got all this knowledge from her. And I love the fact that he might have been checking with her and saying, what, what exactly was rosemary used for? <laughs> how, do you, how do you use comfrey? So I gave that to her. And also there's a lot of hawking and falconry metaphors in Shakespeare, particularly about relationships between men and women. You find that a lot in Taming of the Shrew, for example. So again, I gave, I gave that expertise to her, the idea that he may have got, he may have drawn this knowledge and inspiration from her. She was a formidable person in your book. And so I guess he was also drawn to just the force of her personality and her aura. Exactly. Yeah, I think there's a strong physical attraction between them. And she was drawn to a, a good looking young guy with potential. <laughs> well, I think, I think he's good looking. Yes. But I, as he was, you know, the, the portraits there are, of him, I, I think she was as well. There's a portrait of her. She's very beautiful. She looks, she bears more than a passing resemblance to the actress Saoirse Ronan. I think what she saw in him was something unusual. I think he and I, I think he must have been very unusual in Stratford upon Avon, and certainly not like your average sheep farmer that she would have been mixing with socially in, in and around Shottery. Well, it is a love story among other things, but it is a story very much about grief and creativity, and about finding yourself living in a very different time as you read the book. Maggie, thanks so much for joining us to talk about it. That's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Those were our conversations with John Lithgow and Maggie O'Farrell. We'll have more from the Book Review Podcast Archive next week. These dives into some of our best interviews are something we're going to keep doing throughout the end of this year. And we hope to have an update on what's next for this wonderful podcast then. I'm Gilbert Cruz. Thanks for listening.